read the Quran if you're listening to this. Check the references, learn the context. So learn the verses and read beyond the verses, learn the context, fact check me, please, and prove me where I'm wrong. I welcome it. That's my challenge to you. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, assalamu alaikum, greetings of peace. Welcome to the Dean Show, which is a way of life we try to put out there for everyone to see, helping you understand Islam and Muslims. How you doing, Muhammad? Hi, dude. Hijab, okay. my brother. Assalamu alaikum, okay. How you been? How you doing? Alhamdulillah, not bad. On the Dean Show. <laughs> yeah. Now, there's a guy out there, they call him Louder Than Crowder, Steven Router. Is it something like that? <laughs> Steven Crowder, I think. Yeah, yeah. brought yeah. to our attention. Mm -hmm. And have you noticed there's a lot of people mm. out there talking about Islam? We were uh, with a friend yesterday, mm. and you had mentioned something brilliant. Yeah. You said that many people... Uh, f f do you remember what you were talking about? How people just, you know, just to stay like uh, uh, relevant, uh, relevant mm. they have to like they have to mention Islam. Yeah, why mm. is this? It's part of like what you were talking about before. It's like the mo it's, it is an Islamophobia machine at the moment, isn't it? So um, I, I think nowadays Islam is is undoubtedly part of the political narrative, whether it be the Western political narrative, the Middle Eastern political narrative, the Asian political narrative. Uh, and it's something that you know must be talked about, and a lot of people that um, come across as public intellectuals want to make sure that they m they have their opinion on, is on Islam. Uh, unfortunately, the reality is a lot of people that do talk about Islam uh, are not people who have any knowledge of it and make incredible blunders. Yeah. So the guy who was telling me about him, Chris, he yeah. says, uh, you know, this guy you got to look into uh, uh, Steve Crowder. Mm -hmm. uh, he has some good talking points on some other topics that he mentions yeah so the guy chris tells me he says that you met he says well but you got to correct them on islam right yeah. he said you got to. this guy's totally again another person out of their lane absolutely you follow me so why don't we i thought it'd be a good idea let's see what he's talking about let's take a look and let's uh talk to uh this uh steven louder than crowder why not sounds good all right uh, the Meccans were also acting in defense of their religion. Since it was Muhammad's goal, he was planning on destroying their idols, establishing Islam by force. Hence, th this part of the verse is so critical. Because in the verse uh, 839, where it says, Religion is only for Allah. Meaning that the true justification of violence was unbelief of the opposition. The justification for violence against them was simply unbelief. Muhammad further explains in, in the Sirah, um, Allah must have no rivals. So again, we're coming back to there is no innocent non-Muslim, particularly if you resist Islam. Not just being non-Muslim, but if you say, you know what, no, I'm not. I'm going to be a Buddhist. I'm going to be Christian. I'm gonna be, that is evil. You cannot be innocent. So we need to drill this into you so you understand it. More and more context. Next clip. And he never responded to evil with evil, but rather he pardoned and forgave. What's this guy talking about? Well, um, this is a problem. I mean, this is a classical example of cherry picking a verse from a surah called Surah Al-Anfal, a chapter of the Quran, chapter eight of the Quran, uh, to, to further a, p a political agenda. So let's deal with the verse particularly directly, right? The verse is, وَقَاتِلُوهُمْ حَتَّى لَا تَكُونَ فِتْنَةٌ وَيَكُونَ الدِّينَ كُلُّهُ لِلَّهِ that, And fight them until there is no fitna. Fitna means corruption, yeah? Um, and the exegetes say this means shirk, which means uh, polytheism. And that all of the religion is made for Allah. First and foremost, he didn't even... Um, have made to, for God. Yeah. Made for, for the Allah, creator. For, for the creator. That's right. Because many people, they think right away when mm. you talk about Allah, this is some like different God. Yeah. No, that's a, that's a good point. Some people think it's a moon God or something, yeah. isn't it? So this is the God because he's a Christian. Right. So this is the God of Jesus, the one Jesus prayed to. That's right. Right. So we believe in the same God. We don't believe in a triune God. We don't believe Jesus is God or the, the Holy Spirit is God. But we believe in the creator of the universe. His name is Allah. Allah just means the God or literally the one worthy of worship. Is this the God? And you can go back to this point in yeah. the Lord's Prayer. O oh, our Father, if mm -hmm. you change Ab to Rab, yeah. who art in heaven, mm -hmm. hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Is this the God? The same God, right? That's the God? We don't call him Father like you mentioned, mm -hmm. but it's the same God of Jesus, basically. Why, why don't, if some Christian says, why don't you just call him Father? Well, we don't call him Father because of the connotations that the word Father has. Uh -huh. In chapter 112 of the Quran, it says, that he has... 
He doesn't beget, nor is he begotten. Mm -hmm. So God, we don't believe that he is a child of anyone, nor does he have any children. Mm -hmm. We think that this is a later historical development of the Nicene Council and that which came after it in terms yeah. of ecumenical councils. And, th and when we say Allah, this is, I mean, you have opened up the mm -hmm. Arabic Bible. Yeah. And in Genesis, 17 times, I think Allah is used. Mm -hmm. Allah is used everywhere in the Bible, in the Arabic Bible. Jews word, and Christians. Jews and Christians use the word Allah yeah. to refer to God. Okay, so this is the God, the Creator. Yeah. Okay, please go ahead. So going back to what we were talking about, Surah Al-Anfal, Chapter 8 of the Quran. First and foremost, it's important to know the historical context. So this surah came down um, talking about a particular battle, which was the first ever battle of the Muslims called the Battle of Badr. The Battle of Badr was actually a defensive war of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu whereby the people of Mecca, and he talked about the exile, had just exiled the Muslims. They have been kicked out of their homes. And then they had to set up base in another place, which would then become the capital of the Muslim uh, world for a while, which was Medina. Medina was another city. And uh, what happened was they were coming offensively to attack the Muslims and the Muslims would uh, respond. So how do we actually substantiate that with the verses in that particular surah? Because someone says, OK, well, you're being an apologist now. You're trying to say something which is not historically correct. Well, look at the verses itself. I mean, you don't just ch check chapter 8, verse 39 without checking chapter 8, verse 1 up until whatever it is, 70 whatever verses that are in the, the ver in the chapter. So it's very clear that the context starts maybe around verse 8 or 9, um, where it's talking about uh, that Allah talks about a particular caravan or two, ca two particular caravans um, and he sets the context from there. That's where the verse starts. Um, actually, before that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, um, God Almighty, when we say Allah, it means God Almighty. He says that he caused you to come out of your home. So in other words, he was in a position of safety and the Muslims were in a position of safety and then he was caused to come out of their home. And there were a portion of Muslims that didn't want to do this. They didn't even want to fight. Right, because they felt like they were being um, attacked. In chapter 30 uh, of that particular surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, because now we're kind of building up the context, right? Um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِذْ يَمْكُرُوا بِكَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا لَا يُخْرِجُوكَ أَوْ يَقْتُلُوكَ um, لا يخرو, لا يُثْبِتُوكَ أو, يخ, أَوْ يَقْتُلُوكَ أو, يخ, أَوْ يُخْرِجُوكَ That when the disbelievers planned against you, O Muhammad, that they will grab you, seize you, or kill you, or take you out of your homes. That they planned and Allah planned and Allah is the best of planners. In other words, this again indicates the fact that the Muslims were defensive because actually who was who are the ones making the plans to kill who? The Quran is explicit in saying that the, uh, the, the disbelievers or the polytheists of the time were the ones who are making the plans to attack the Muslims. Then we lead up to verse 39 because it's, once again, it's not a verse in vacuum. It's a verse in context, right? So we're trying to lead up to that. Verse 39 then tells us that in this context of war, then fight those individuals, i.e. those people who are fighting you. And how, how can we also prove that this is a, a war context? In verse 57 of the same surah, Allah mentions the word harb in Arabic, which means war. So the word war is explicitly mentioned. And you'll find in verse 61 what's even more interesting. It says, وَإِذْ, uh, إِلَى السَّلْمِ فَجَنَحْ لَهَا So if, if they incline to peace, then you should also incline to peace. So when you look at the whole surah, when you look at the whole chapter, and when you look at all of these, um, uh, these points, you realize very quickly that this was a defensive war. Now, we're not saying that Islam only prescribes defensive wars. We're just saying that if you put that in the context, this particular verse, in the context of what we're talking about, this was a defensive war, right? That's point one. Point two, what he said was absolutely one of the biggest blunders I've ever heard a commentator make of, of his, um, you know, uh, significance here. He's got a lot of uh, viewers. I can't believe that he was able to get away with this. He says the reason why um, Muslims are killing non-Muslims is because of their non-belief. So if someone was a Buddhist or something like that, then they would be able to be killed. This is absolutely false and can be refuted with two or three verses of the Quran quite easily. One of them is chapter 22, verse 39, where it says, It says that basically the, it has been allowed, permission has been given. Udina means the permission has been given to the believers to fight 
بِأَنَّهُمْ ظُلِمُوا Because they have been oppressed. So this is very significant. Why is it very significant? Because the reasoning, because he says the reason, right? The Qur'an says also the reason. The reasoning behind fighting is given in this verse. So in other words, he's saying the reason that Muslims um, are, uh, are commanded, were commanded historically to fight non-Muslims was because they were non-Muslims. The Qur'an says otherwise. The Qur'an says the reason... It says, بِأَنَّهُمْ ظُلِمُوا Because they have been oppressed. Now, this is extremely important. Because here, the language that is used is, the, is couched. Now, the Quran is couching this in language of justification. The syntax is a syntax which is couched, or the phraseology used is phraseology which is couched in language of justification. It's not language of kill them because they are non-Muslims or disbelievers. Now, that's a very important point. To add to that, you have chapter 60, verse 8, which we've mentioned in the previous show, which is important to actually mention one more time on this. It says, لا ينهاكم الله عن الذين لم يقاتلوكم في الدين ولم يخرجوكم من دياركم أن تبروهم وتقسطوا إليهم إن الله يحب المقسطين. That certainly Allah does not disallow you from being just or being kind to the disbelievers. They don't take you out of your home and they don't kill you, that you be just to them and kind to them, that Allah certainly loves those who are just. So in other words, the two things which would enable someone to fight someone else who is a non-believer, say, or even a believer in some cases, in the Quran chapter 49, it says you can, Muslims can fight each other in certain cases where, there, where there's transgression going on, is if, they're fighting is, um, if there is fighting, so in other words, if they're combatants, or if, or if they are trying to um, physically take you out of your homes. Um, so all of this, and obviously chapter 5 verse 32 um, so whoever kills a person for um, other than murder or creating corruption in the land is as if they killed all of humanity. This is a verse which is not abrogated, is, is, is still in place and includes Muslims and non-Muslims according to the consensus of the scholars. All of these are verses which indicate that what this person is saying is not actually something you'll find if you look at the whole Islamic corpus and we've just looked at the Quran. A, 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 a holistic, if we look at it in a holistic way. Obviously, I've mentioned this in, another, uh, in our previous video. Um, also, we could mention the fact that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, مَنْ قَتَلَ مُعَاهِدًا لَمْ يَرِحْ رَائِحَةَ الْجَنَّةِ That whoever kills a non-combatant, non-believer, he will not smell the fragrance of heaven. Muahid, according to Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani, who is the biggest scholar of uh, interpretation of the hadith probably ever to write a commentary of the hadith in Sunni Muslim history called Fath al-Bari he says this means someone who basically is a, uh, either what you call a mustatmin or he uh, this includes a mustatmin al-mu'ahid and someone who's a dhimmi so in other words anyone who there is a contract of um, who is not a harbi a harbi is a combatant so you could actually translate this hadith the saying of the Prophet, whoever kills a non-combatant, he will never smell the fragrance of heaven. Non-combatant, non-believer will never smell the fragrance of heaven. So here, the question is, how can you explain those verses and, and, and a hadith? If you're, if you're saying that the reason why Muslims are instructed to kill non-believers is because they, um, they are non-believers, how can you explain 2239 where it says the reason is because they have been oppressed? How can you explain chapter 60 verse 8? How can you explain chapter 5 verse 32? How can you explain the hadith which says whoever, whoever kills a non-combatant, a non-believer, they will never smell the fragrance of heaven? You can't explain them. That's the reality of it. So it becomes a checkmate position for those individuals who are advocating um, the correct position of Islam, which is that we are not allowed to kill non-combatant non-believers. We're not allowed to kill anybody, in fact. It's, 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 it's haram. It's, it's, to, it's, it's actually a, uh, impermissible to kill anyone except in the context of war where there's a leader, uh, a Muslim leader who's, who is leading uh, a Muslim uh, army, etc.